I'm also happy to have this evening. And it has been my prayer throughout the week, and will be, continue to be my prayer, that all that is said and done will bring glory to God and will promote a true understanding of His will for all men everywhere. I believe I should begin this evening by making a couple of points of accuracy. Just so there can be no misunderstanding, I see several faces this evening that uh, are here for the first time. Let me first begin by saying that uh, Mr. Vaughn may or may not know my theological persuasion, but one thing has become very apparent tonight. He certainly does not know the capacity of my wallet. I couldn't send my kids with two dollars, much less twenty. I think that it is important to realize, since I was called on the carpet for not sticking to Bible definitions, that I was asked to answer a question regarding a word that is not biblical. That word is denomination. I said last night that I answered the question using Webster's not because I didn't understand denomination, but because I was not sure how Mr. Vaughn understood denomination. He did not define it as he understood it, and it has become apparent these four days that we do not understand several words alike. So it is not safe to presume anyone's understanding of a word. Also, to clarify, uh, my statement was not that the church is a denomination and a sect. Uh, since I had chosen a neutral definition of denomination, one of those definitions described a denomination as a sect or body. And uh, I thought that I was very clear to point out that the term in that definition was the term body, body. Now, it is my intent, it's my job to deny the proposition at hand that uh, Mr. Varner has read at the beginning of our meeting. Now, I may do that in a number of fashions. Uh, one of them is simply to take the evidence that has been put forth by Brother Vaughn and to show that that evidence is either untrustworthy and unreliable, the source itself, or that his reference or his use of that source of evidence was misappropriated so that the statements he referred to or the proof that he used was not what was meant by the source or not what was proposed by the source. Now one may misappropriate either through deliberate misrepresentation or through simple uh, a failure to understand, and I would not presume to judge either one of those. However, when he referred to the honest appraisal of Ed Bousman that instrumental music uh, was condemned by the New Testament and ought not to be used, Something just struck me very odd because I wake up to Ed Bousman on the radio about every Sunday morning and uh, listen to much of what he says. And as I recall, this program always ends and begins with the singing of a song. And as I recall, um, almost always, if not always, there is musical um, accompaniment by an instrument. So that just didn't strike me. So I called Mr. Bousman today and uh, simply told him that uh, the quotation had been made and asked him if indeed it was his opinion that instrumental music ought not to be used. For if it was his opinion, then that was a very, very good proof because Brother Vaughn said that's what Ed said. I'd like to play for you the recording, by his permission, of 
that part of our telephone conversation that pertains to the article that Mr. Vaughn read from last night.
think it is apparent from that telephone conversation that the very point that Mr. Vaughn was making and using as his evidence proves just the opposite. And, uh, I appreciate Mr. Vaughn's statement that Ed was being honest. And now we understand that Ed was honestly denying the proposition that his document was used to support. I might also review some of the denials that I have presented. But one reason the proposition cannot be true is that it would make even Christians to be sinful and sinners if it were true. That those things which are authorized as Mr. Vaughn has demonstrated his understanding of authorized by direct command or equally authority, example or inference, and that the specific instance of mechanical music being used in worship not being authorized by the New Testament is simply false. I would also like to use the wisdom from a brother. This brother is from the Non-Instrument Church of Christ. His name is Bob Williams. He preaches in Clarendon, Texas. This article is not satire. This article is exactly, as I read it to you, the intent and the motive of this man. He is a member of the Non-Instrument Church of Christ. Traditional anti-instrumental arguments have serious drawbacks. In order of increasing seriousness, these may be summarized as follows. Such arguments are contrary to the very best elements of our restoration tradition. He then refers to the same issue regarding this so-called law of silence, excuse me, not the law of silence, the equal authority of inference and command, referring to the Declaration and Address. Now, I, I believe last night, I may be wrong, I believe last night when I referred to it, I referred to it as Alexander Campbell's work. That was a slip of the tongue. Uh, it should be Thomas Campbell. Nevertheless, the law of the silence of the Scriptures is never spelled out in the New Testament. Now, that's not coming from an instrumental brother. That's coming from a non-instrumental brother. Logically, it is self-eliminating. The few attempts that have been made to find a biblical truth text for such a doctrine have been so contrived and so absurdly out of context that even most who hold to the traditional doctrine will not use them. Also, I noted that the word only in this proposition would make even the devoutest Christian a sinner. Notice what Brother Williams says. Not only is the law of silence of the scriptures internally inconsistent, but it is also inconsistent with our practice, so inconsistent with our practice, that it makes even our most sincere folk appear hypocritical. Traditional practice among the majority of churches of Christ demands that everyone accept the, the law of silence and apply it to instruments and missionary societies. But that traditional stance refuses to accept the silence of the scriptures when it is applied to radio and TV programs, orphans' homes, Sunday schools, church buildings, public address systems, and a vast array of other innovations. In other words, the traditional argument says if we use it, the law of silence does not apply. But if someone else uses it, it does. In reality, tradition, not scripture, is the true basis for the usual argument. This evening, I asked Mr. Vaughn to respond to these questions 
It is possible for one to sing in congregational worship, directed by a song leader using songbooks without committing sin in doing so. He stated that that is true. The New Testament authorizes congregational singing. He stated that is true. History reveals that Christians in apostolic times did not build special meeting houses. He stated that is true. The New Testament authorizes Christians to greet one another with a holy kiss or a kiss of love. Therefore, Christians who greet one another with a handshake commit sin in doing so. He stated that is false. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn is doing exactly what his brother, Mr. Williams, from Texas, has suggested. He's invalidating whatever argument he was trying to make by not being consistent. What is true for us, he maintains, in the use of the musical instrument, is not true for him. It is possible for one to sing in congregational worship directed by a song leader using song books without committing sin in doing so. Where are either song books or song leaders authorized in the New Testament? The New Testament authorizes congregational singing. Now, within the context of the chapters of both Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, we find he is not talking, speaking specifically about congregational assemblies at all, but on how to let the peace of Christ and the word of Christ affect us through our daily lives every day of the week, so that the teaching and admonishing one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, spiritual songs, is not addressed exclusively or even directly, although it has been implied by Mr. Barnes, to congregational worship. History reveals that Christians in apostolic times did not build special meeting houses. He says that is true. Now last night, he offered a small defense of their meeting house, even though he acknowledges that history reveals that Christians in apostolic times did not build special meeting houses. Now, I have no problem with that, except he used a chart to show that history proves that the same Christians in the same apostolic times did not use the musical instrument. Now, he expected you to accept the the proof of history, but here he denies the proof of history. Mr. Williams says that when we use it, it does not apply. If someone else uses it, it does. The New Testament authorizes Christians to greet one another with a holy kiss or a kiss of love. Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 13, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, all say, salute or greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, 14 says, the kiss of love. I have a box for Mr. Vaughn. Will Mr. Vaughn please write in the square below the New Testament scripture which authorizes Christians to greet one another with a handshake. Now remember, according to his proposition, the New Testament teaches that only those things which are authorized by the New Testament are things which can be done by men living today without committing sin in so doing. It is interesting to note that Mr. Williams from Texas, ministering with the non-instrument church, one of them, says even within the anti-instrumental segment of the Churches of Christ, surveys have shown that the majority do not believe singing with an instrument to be sinful. I don't know his documentation. Uh, this is a 
readily available publication, and perhaps Mr. Vaughn has access to it, he can deny that statement of his brother, his fellow evangelist. However, this is not satire. This is what he believes. In my hometown, Raw, Missouri, there were, at least there were two years ago when I was there, five churches in the community of Walla that were non or anti-instrumental churches of Christ. And they refused to have fellowship with each other because of some of the additional exclusions that they saw, the law of exclusion, which is another one of those laws that's not in the New Testament. One of the problems that this proposition has produced is the very problem that Mr. Vaughn accused us of being guilty of. That by using the musical instrument, we have promoted division in the body of Christ. I think that's why I understood him. Now, if that may not have been his exact words, and if that's not what he meant, that we have produced division in the body of Christ, please, uh, I will would like for him to clarify that. Uh, it's interesting that he would acknowledge that we were in the body of Christ. What's also interesting is that there are at least 28 different groups of the non or anti-instrument churches of Christ. Now, by their own admission, this suggests that there must be something wrong with this prohibitive silence principle. And it must either have a flaw in its reasoning, or else we must admit, all of us, that only that narrowest group, the group that forbids only but one cup, that the cup has to have a handle on it to distinguish it from a chalice, right on down the line, that only that narrowest group that excludes the most people is the most faithful to the word of God. Mr. Vaughn, in the huge affirmative presentation he has made, has also committed several logical fallacies. I certainly appreciate the spirit of his presentation tonight. But he has certainly committed the logical fallacy of relevance consisting of argumentum ad hominem instead of disputing the truth of what was asserted, tended to attack the one who made the assertion. He has committed the logical fallacy of argumentum ad ignorantium, where it is argued that a proposition is true simply on the basis that it has not been true false. Somehow, because I would not or could not put a scripture in the box of the proposition that he placed before me, that somehow made his proposition true. That's logically fallacious. The fallacy of a complex question, where a speaker poses a complex question, a second speaker unwarily responds yes or no, or true or false, and the first speaker then draws a fallacious inference that may seem appropriate. Which has happened in his ability to infer from my answers that I condone the use of angel food cake and coffee for communion emblems, that I condone by his entrance pouring or sprinkling, that I condone the establishment of religion overseen by the Pope, and numerous other entrances that seem appropriate because of my response to the complex question he asked. Another question, similar, that which you asked of me this evening, the Christian Missionary Society, as an addition and or substitute for doing the work of the church, is explicitly forbidden by the New Testament. Well, as I understand and perfectly am willing to abide by his definition of explicit during these last two days of his proposition, I would answer that question strong. But it's certainly going to be interesting to see the inferences that he will draw from my answers, which have no basis 
and logical reason. A word about Ephesians 5.19. He has suggested, and it appears to be one of his larger arguments, that when a person sings and musical instrumentation is present, but there is no longer singing. Think about that the next time you hear Frank Sinatra on the radio. Thank you.